Thought Leadership from PwC. The bottom line up front is I really think CEOs can do a bit better job in, in really aligning with investors around the priorities and the actions that they place on climate change as it relates to their particular companies. Hello. Today we're back talking ESG, this time with a look at how companies can better understand and align with investor expectations. This is PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. PwC recently conducted research based on our most recent global CEO and investor surveys to understand a key question. How much alignment is there, or is there not, between company leadership and the expectations of investors when it comes to ESG issues? The results were insightful and may even surprise you. To share these results and her insights, we've brought Nadia Picard, PwC's global reporting leader, back on the podcast. Those who've heard Nadia in the past will recall she always brings an insightful and actionable perspective to you. And this conversation is no exception. With that, let's get started. All right. So Nadia, welcome back to the podcast. So nice to have you on. And I think this is a great topic, especially given the status of all the standard setting and rulemaking that's been going on. But we're really going to hone in today on how CEOs, CFOs, and really their companies can meet investor expectations on uh, sustainability. And I know that's becoming an increasingly important topic for companies as they think about adopting these rules, but then how they can really make that more meaningful. But I know to start off, we did some research where we looked at the perspectives of the CEOs and investors on climate change and financial implications for the companies. So can you share that research? Sure, Heather. And thank you so much for for having me again. Uh, Glad to see you. Look, um, we've looked at some data from our Global Investor Survey and our 2023 CEO survey and and looked at how do we can identify the gaps between CEO actions and perceptions and and priorities and those of investors, right? And what we actually found is that there is quite a bit of disconnect between what CEOs think is important and how they want to action things, particularly in terms of climate action, and the emphasis that investors are placing on it, right? So we looked at different levels of concern between climate actions on climate change and the perceived financial impact of climate change. So also there, we did find some some disconnect, right? So um, I, I think to take basically the bottom line up front is I really think CEOs can do a bit better job in in really aligning with investors around the priorities and the actions that they place on climate change as it relates to their particular companies. All right. So then kind of pulling on that thread and digging into this disconnect, what are some of the key areas where we saw differences? And when you are talking to CFOs, what are you telling them to do to start to address this? So it starts with a difference in risk perception, right? So CEOs currently see climate change a bit less urgent than investors do, right? So we ask CEOs how exposed their companies will be to financial losses due to climate change, both by physical hazard, just as well as transition risk over the next 12 months, and then also over the next five years, right? And then on top of that, we asked the CEOs to say how much they think the transition to new energy sources will actually affect the profitability in their industry over the next 10 years. And then we asked the investors exactly the same question um, and how they expect companies to invest in these areas. And it really turns out that investors anticipate that climate change and the energy transition will have quite a bit stronger effects on companies' financial performance than CEOs do, really. 
So to bring that to life with maybe two figures, right? So 22% of the investors we surveyed believe that the companies they will cover will be highly or even extremely exposed to climate change in the coming year. So in the next 12 months, right? But only 14%, as opposed to 22, only 14% of the CEOs said the same thing about their companies. And if we take the same question sort of for the next five years, right? So how does climate change exposure threaten the company over the next five years? Both groups showed more concern. So in the longer term, both groups showed more concern. But again, investors, 37% of them expressed that they are extremely or highly concerned and only 22% of CEOs. So ex again, there is sort of a disconnect, a gap in, in risk perception around this. So Nadia, before we dig into the gap, one thing that struck me when you were talking 22% of investors in the next 12 months. It's basically one in five thought the companies they were covering would be highly, or I think you said extremely highly uh, impacted. It's a very short timeline for that big of an impact. So again, before we dig into the, the gap, did it surprise you to see that level of response? Yes and no. I, I think by the time we did the survey, there was quite a bit of really much increased awareness around both the physical threats um, and the, the sort of longer term exposure by transition risks um, that really f companies are faced with. And we sort of came out of the summer again with floods and drought and fires and everything that really amplified the, the urgency of, of the actual, really, again, physical exposure um, that climate change might have on companies. So I'm not that surprised about the number. And actually, I think that's a good point you're making on time frame. So these surveys were done in the fall of 2022 and winter, sort of 2022, 23 time frame. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, the investor survey, we conducted the questioning around September, October-ish um, of 2022. And I think the timing for the CEO survey was almost overlapping. It was a bit more like October, November-ish. So um, very close time frames, however. Well, and it's also, you know, it's interesting you say, because we're coming off of last summer, but then now we're recording this only a couple of weeks after I think New York City had the worst air, either on record, but definitely the worst air it has ever had. And I mean, it looked like it was night practically during the day. And I, I do think that's a sign of, you know, some of what what we're seeing. But when you see this gap, then if we go back to that, what are some of the reasons you think that maybe CEOs, CFOs aren't, I wouldn't call it, I don't want to say prioritizing, but aren't looking at it as big as a threat as maybe their investors are? I think it's very much a question of what are the current priorities in the company? I mean, we looked at a period in time when CEOs and CFOs were faced with many challenges around macroeconomic developments, unrest, um, inflation. So a multitude of crises was coming at them. And I, m my sense is that really the, the, the immediate concerns, the things that were immediate and really coming hard at them were prioritized over climate change, whereas investors may have taken a more balanced, more equal look at the multiple crises because they do need to evaluate that with many more companies. And it, it wasn't that imminent to them that it's only inflation or only macroeconomic developments or supply chain issues mm -hmm. uh, that they're faced with. So I, I think that is part of the explanation. Although it's an interesting point, because if I'm a CEO of a company, there's always going to be, I don't know, whether it's supply chain, inflation, like all these these different issues you've said, there are always going to be pressing. But if you don't turn your attention to climate, then, I mean, that it's not going to go away and it's just going to become more and more urgent. And so as you sort of think about it, how do you reconcile those those two points? 
Well, I think that's exactly what the data are saying us, right? Investors do not expect it to go away. And they're really asking um, companies to start on actioning to reduce their greenhouse gas um, emissions in their operations and their supply chain. And um, it, it's really investors do recognize inflation, for example, as an immediate risk, but they also do expect that this risk is reducing over the next five years, let's say. And they're challenging the companies that they invest in, they're challenging their CEOs to take that development um, and, and start acting on it now because they also recognize that the action will take a bit of time to take effect. It's not like you switch a flip and flip a switch. Either, <laughs> either way. Um, either way, exactly. So And, and, and it's solved, right? So, so that's where the pressure is coming from, uh, the investors to the CEOs to start now. And again, the challenge by investors is not do the one or the other. I think most unfortunately, the challenge by investors and actually everybody around companies is do both. Start looking at how you address climate change whilst keeping up profitability and innovation and dealing with all the other challenges as well. Well, and I think what's interesting to that exact point is that if you actually look that we in the survey results, we actually saw that dealing with uh, that greenhouse gas was fifth in the list of investor priorities, and we had otherwise business, innovation, and others. So again, how do you kind of reconcile those different points of view? Uh, the other day when I was discussing sustainability reporting and the related actions with someone and the term of integrated thinking um, was, was thrown out there. So the challenge really is to CEOs to and, and CFOs with the help of CFOs, and we can get to that in a second, but mm-hmm. to really link climate action into value creation. So link the climate action into how they conduct their business, how they might change production processes to be more energy efficient and through that also more cost efficient to link the insight into particularly climate unfriendly products um, and compare them with possible alternatives that might be even more valued by the consumer and through that create even more value for the company, right? And that is really hard, I think, to recognize that. (laughs) It's it's really hard, but that is the challenge that that has been put on the CEOs and the CFOs as well. So it's interesting because I think what you're saying then, and you said it, integrated thinking, you can't look at each of these risks separately, but instead... It's almost, we've talked about this before. I actually think you and I spoke about this, Nadia, that in some ways this is also an opportunity. And I think what you're saying is if you flip the thinking to the opportunity side and then you view it more holistically, maybe that's where there is some way for um, companies to be addressing all of these risks at the same time. Yeah, and it's, uh, Heather, I think it's holistically, yes, it's the right word, but it does involve a lot of detail looking at it right because and and that's really where the cfo comes in with the finance function that the cfo typically runs where you can't look at climate data on a consolidated level once a year and expect anybody's ability to impact and influence that you have to take those data down to a country by country product side by side or even product by product basis to really find the actionable items um, that the company can actually influence. And most unfortunately, I think you also have to look at them a lot more frequently Mm -hmm. than once a year, right? Because if I take a step back and say, okay, look, the standards require us to report annually now as they come in, it's about annual corporate reporting. But the standards are also about strategy and target setting and milestones and then the performance against those milestones. I think that already makes it clear the way I say it, that 
I don't think anybody wants to be surprised by year end saying, well, looks like we're missing the milestones. So what? That's not <laughs> happening, right? That is not happening. That no. requires more frequent budgeting and forecasting action. So the whole thing that we have for financial reporting starts to really um, transcend into sustainability reporting and particularly, particularly climate reporting. So if I'm, again, sort of looking at the gaps, I know in some of the research you guys did, you saw specific places where things fell short. And I definitely want to come back to measurement, but maybe we can talk about strategy first in terms of where are we seeing that there's sort of gaps in terms of what investors are expecting and then what progress is actually being made. Mm -hmm. So investors have asked for some specific information that they want to see for companies to take action on, right? And, and, And again, that's where we see a shortcoming between where investors want to see action and where CEOs say that they have completed or started the suspective action. And if, if we look at this in particularly, it's about implementing initiatives to reduce emissions, innovating around climate-friendly products and processes. It's around developing a data-driven climate strategy and then implementing initiatives to protect the company against those physical climate impacts and then also applying an internal carbon pricing policy. And in all these areas, again, there is a difference between how much investors think that these particular actions are effective in addressing climate change and want companies to employ these actions and where CEOs have said that they've already started um, or even completed those actions. So that is very, very concrete advice on how can you reconcile the gap between my company's actions and investor expectations, and through that actually increase investor engagement, which then translates into almost more value for the company. So one question on that then is you reference sort of analogies to financial reporting and clearly from a financial reporting perspective, the very clear ways of communicating with investors. So here in the US, we have your SEC reporting, or if you're a private company, there's there's other ways to share financial information. And then you have your press releases and you have lots on your website and, you know, so on and so forth. It's not necessarily so clear for sustainability reporting and climate. I mean, some companies have reporting, some don't. Obviously, that's changing, and I do want to get to the the new rules towards the end. But what do you say companies can do to better communicate what what they're doing? Because I sometimes think maybe there likely is a gap. I'm not questioning the gap, but I also think there's a perhaps a communication gap here. And so how can companies help address that? Um, I'm almost going back to to something I said in 2008 um, in, in, the, in the financial crisis. <laughs> that is crisis. 15 years ago. I love financial <laughs> yeah, That is 15 years ago, but it's still valid, right? So in the financial yes. crisis, we've seen so many companies go absolutely silent and stop communicating, which then really put the investors yes. into a spin. Um, and and they, the companies lost the trust of the investors because they did not communicate. So let's start with you should communicate, right? You have to engage into the dialogue, even if it's uncomfortable in the beginning. And then, um, and, and maybe that is by virtue of my role, but I think a really good protection that companies have when they start this communication is actually following standards, following protocols, right? And the more robust those standards and protocols are, in my mind, we have two effects. On the one side, yes, it's more difficult for the companies to report under something that is really well defined, But on the flip side, that gives a lot of protection to the companies because they can always sort of claim compliance with something that is out there and that is broadly understood and that people can have a debate on, is that the right interpretation or not? But there is something that companies can hold on to. And then you add 
the assurance on top of all of that. So that third party verification assurance of the claims made, of the progress made, of the underlying data. And then you start having a bit of the same framework than you have in financial reporting, mm-hmm. something to add on to and something to start the conversation with. And then again, in analogy, get into that dialogue about the granularity and, and the frequency and, and the specifics that companies have with investors right now, regardless on whether that is in the US or in Europe or mm-hmm. anywhere else in the world. So it's an interesting point. And I think we've touched on this at least briefly before that, you know, a lot of sustainability reporting to date has been bespoke, right? So each company is kind of, I'm going to use sort of picking and choosing, although I'm sure CFO may not characterize it that way. But and to some extent, if you're not, to your point, following a recognized framework, you're inherently picking and choosing because if nothing else, you're picking the framework you're going to to apply. So you are are viewing, I think, the emergence then of, you know, we've seen hopefully the final draft of the ESRSs. We're going to see the final relatively soon. We're going to see the ISSB rules next week, hopefully sometime this year, the SEC climate rules. And actually that that's something companies should be welcoming because it gives them some level of surety. And then it also gives a more clear way of communicating with investors that sort of understood by, I'll call it both sides. Exactly. And it does also give you that protection against, I'm going to use the bad word, greenwashing, right? Mm-hmm. Because, um, I mean, and again, financial reporting, you report net income and cash flows as defined by GAAP. And that gives you the protection to say, this is a credible net income and cash flow statement. In sustainability reporting, if you can say, I report on my sustainability affairs as defined by the ESRSs or as defined by um, the ISSB standards, then that gives you the protection of, of, of having a robust process that you can refer back to and, again, look at it in a complete and more rounded way. So let me ask a question and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the standards and what companies should do. But I thought you made such an interesting point that you can't sort of wait until the end and see the progress you've made. It's no different than if I'm managing a budget. You don't sort of hope it's going to work out, but you you monitor along the way. And I think for many companies, they're still in a stage where even gathering information once a year is taking a huge amount of effort. And so I don't want to to shift us over entirely into what should you do, but do, are you seeing companies that are building mechanisms to report more frequently? You know, you gave these examples on a product basis or site by site basis, or is that still mostly aspirational? We're starting to see very clear plans of company embedding sustainability into their processes and systems at the level of granularity that we're currently talking about, right? So um, I'm aware of a really big company in Germany that is looking at product compliance, that is also looking at product footprint, carbon footprint, um, with then all the other safeguards that, that come around just a carbon reporting. But as we build out the system of scope three information and the whole value chain being considered in company sustainability and carbon reporting particularly, Mm -hmm. then there's almost no other choice than starting to look at on a product level um, because that's the information that your customer wants. And I think that ultimately is the information that the end consumer will want to also place their decisions on. Now, I agree in that demand side, we see varying levels of maturity, but at the company side, more and more companies are thinking about it and are looking at which system helps me in doing that, um, which tools do I need to employ that will enable me to do this more frequent reporting? How do I connect it to my current ERP processes and systems in order to, to gain the efficiencies that I need? to not do it on a spreadsheet once a year anymore. 
So I think to that point, you mentioned earlier assurance and also just the benefit of reporting in accordance with sort of a recognized framework. And was there anything that came out of the survey that kind of would lean into that in terms of, you know, the the beneficial impact of those? You also use the word greenwashing. Uh, so anything about that in the survey where companies can, there there's actions companies can take to make sure that the, um, that the, actions they're taking on climate change are being recognized by investors? Yeah, just uh, very clearly, the shocking number um, on the one hand side, um, 87% of investors do think that corporate reporting contains at least some greenwashing. That's a really shocking number. And I know that greenwashing is not defined, but I think the view is In the absence of really robust reporting criteria, investors think that there might be something not properly transparently explained. Let's put it that way. And then on the flip side, 75% of investors think that independent reasonable assurance, so so assurance at the level of of an audit, right? So so really at, at the same level as we have on financial reporting right now, would then give them a higher level, a moderate or higher level of confidence in the sustainability reporting. So you take both numbers and I think the path forward is relatively clear, but it unfortunately does go back to the effort that companies would have to put into the granularity and and the, the, the level of care around the data they report. Well, and I think that 87% really is shocking if you think about it, because can you imagine if people were issuing financial reports that people thought there was like an 87%, you know, let's call it fudging rate in it. And, you know, I do think that's where you can see that clear linkage with assurance. But also if we go sort of full circle to companies communicating with investors, you know, having that clear communication of what your objectives are and how you're progressing against your objectives, I think also helps investors and other users of the information have more assurance, I'll use the word assurance, maybe uh, more confidence that the information, they're not just receiving a bunch of random data, but there is a message here and, you know, how it fits in with the strategy. And I guess to that point on strategy, we we touched on this, but if, again, if I'm a company and I'm thinking, I, I want this to be more in my strategy versus sort of off to the side, how are we thinking about that or what are we seeing when we kind of look at that integration? Well, I, I, I think currently it's patchy companies that have been at it for a longer period of time and actually entered into that investor or stakeholder dialogue around their sustainability reporting are more progressed in that integration of sustainability in their overall business strategy. But all the standards and frameworks that are emerging right now, whether that is TCFD, whether that is the ISSB standards, or whether that is the ESRS standards under the CSRD, they're all extremely focused on that linkage, on that really integrated reporting, on that overarching corporate reporting that takes a sustainable business strategy underpinned by financial performance indicators and metrics and non-financial sustainability performance indicators and and provides that linkage. As the standards actually require disclosures around how have you considered sustainability aspects in your business strategy? What is your governance around these sustainability factors as embedded in your business strategy? And only from that do we then enter into the target setting, the policies around the individual sustainability topics, and then the metrics that you report again to measure progress against those targets and performance under these policies. I'm I'm getting quite passionate about that because I think (laughs) that I'm I'm serious because I think it's not about a bunch of metrics that sit mm-hmm. somewhere on, on uh, in some disclosure without context. It's about that that really that connectivity between what am I doing 
how am I subjected to risks and opportunities as it pertains to climate change or other sustainability factors? And particularly if we look at the European standards, also what is my impact? Mm -hmm. But again, embedded in what I do as a company. Well, and I think you said you're getting passionate about it, but it really is, I think, a theme of what we've been talking about here. There is a gap. The way to fill the gap, first of all, is not to just throw random information, but really is to say, what is my strategy? How am I addressing my strategy and reporting against it? And I think you said this earlier, it's really no different than financial reporting. It's just we've had, I don't know, 100 years <laughs> to develop our financial reporting system. And we're trying to do this on a, a much more rapid timeline. But without those you know, that word transparency, we're really not going to close that gap. Companies won't be able to because investors are still going to feel like they're not getting what they're looking for. Yeah. And, and also, let's not forget, I mean, we're talking about investors and the gap between CEOs and investors and, and, and how CFOs can help with that. But, but it's also beyond investors, the other stakeholders, your employees, your customers that are really starting to look more and more for this information. Yeah. And I mean, we've definitely, that's another topic we've touched on previously, but I think it's an important one to bring up here that, you know, if you want employees to be engaged and if you want your customers to want to buy your product, some of this, even, you know, you give this product level reporting, eventually that's what companies are going to be looking for. So again, if you think of the opportunity or not companies, customers, so if you look at the opportunity side of things, there's the company that can get ahead of that really is the one that's creating their own opportunity. And again, sort of flipping this from a risk to a benefit. Yeah. And then, uh, Heather, I really think that that is very important to take the implementation of uh, climate data reporting in a company away from the nuisance thinking and mm -hmm. it's oh so hard into the strategic objective behind that really from a very clear business objective, right? Because we're talking about op unearthing opportunities that take early advantage of, for example, increasing prices for fossil fuels versus renewable or energy from renewables. So, so that whole energy transition um, we know that that is happening, particularly mm -hmm. in Europe, for example. It's it's really about, so again, what does that mean to me and, and how do I action that in a granular business context already now as much as possible? So you've touched on this a few times. I want to really dig into it. How, what, what do you see the role of the CFO and helping the CEO and others in the organization in, I'd say both pieces. One is communication because obviously that's critical, but also just the strategy of, of addressing climate change. So the communication, um, if we look at that the investor relations function, so the dialogue between the company and investors, um, in my experience, with listed companies or companies that become listed, I have longstanding IPO um, history, um, often sits in that CFO function, right? Because that's where the numbers sit, that's where the business knowledge sits, that's where the budget sits, that's where... Um, the art of managing the expectation towards an investor consensus um, is rooted in the business planning and budgeting that is hosted by the CFO function. So we just take all this by analogy um, and, and take benefit of the experience that the CFO has in these matters and apply them to sustainability reporting. So that's reason number one. And, and that is also then where the CFO, by virtue of the feedback from the investors, so this outside-in feedback that he gets from the investors, becomes a very valuable business partner to the CFO in having input into strategy discussions by bringing that outside perspective into the strategy discussions. Um, and then number two, it's really that command of data and granularity of data and the ability to think about data at a granular level, 
with quality and how they are produced, how they are governed, and how they are then pulled together in a proper business analysis. Yeah, so I'm simply talking about bottom-up planning, budgeting, and then forecasting with matching the data to actuals. That all typically is not something that sustainability departments think about. Um, that is something that the CFO thinks about all the time. And that's the same thing that also should be applied to, let's say, climate data or gender pay gap data or other sustainability related data points. So let me ask a follow up question to that, because we have sort of all different levels of, I'm going to say levels of listeners ranging from like a CFO, audit committee members and otherwise to, you know, maybe a financial reporting director or someone who's on the controller's team. And if you were talking to the, the, uh, the more junior people, what advice would you be giving them now? And I'll warn um, the listeners, this is totally off what Nadia thought I was going to be asking her. So this will definitely be impromptu, but I think it's a, um, still important that this is not all just sitting with the CFO and the CEO, but everyone in the organization has a role to play. So just curious, Nadia, what advice you would give to them? Let me turn it around and, and let me maybe report back on the conversations I have with our people here at PwC. And, and my background is in capital markets and accounting advisory. So clearly on the financial reporting side of corporate reporting. And everybody I talk to here of the younger people, the associates that have just joined PwC up to the senior management directors, they understand that they need to start looking at sustainability reporting because it is part of what the future of corporate reporting is. And if they like to have a future in corporate reporting, they need to understand that part of it as well. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to become an expert mm -hmm. in it, right? Um, so, so let me take that anxiety away because that immediately <laughs> comes back to me from, from our people as well. But at least that that good understanding of what we're talking about, how it relates, and we haven't even touched on all the the connectivity between financial reporting and sustainability reporting and how it all needs to be mm -hmm. really thought together and be devoid of any contradictions, right? People start understanding here that it has to come together and that they have to start thinking about it as well. And let me caveat that as well, um, or at least explain it uh, by way of background um, to those who haven't listened to me before. I'm German. I'm from Germany. I sit in Germany. So obviously in the middle of the European Union, where our thinking and our processing around these matters um, may be, in, in terms of timing, possibly not in depth, but in terms of timing, a bit more advanced. And it's ever so present in everyday discussions that it mm -hmm. might have permeated a bit more into sort of the general population than it might have in, in other parts of this world. All right. Well, it's definitely a helpful uh, answer. And I do think your point on the connection between financial reporting and sustainability reporting is important here because one of the other things, if we, you know, we think about this is that in some ways, I, I think people who come from a financial reporting background, you're used to learning new topics, new accounting standards, new whatever it is, and you have a methodology you can apply. And this is another one of those topics that we can bring that benefit to. All Absolutely. right. So here's, here's my second off script question uh, for you. I'm not sure this one will be harder or easier, but you know, we're very focused on, on climate and understandably, and we have, you know, the Paris Accord and otherwise this really driving action towards a certain point. And one of the things we've been talking about here on the podcast, Nadia, is biodiversity, because now with the Montreal Agreement and otherwise, we're going to start seeing expectations of, let's call it better measurement in that area as well. But I also think you know, if people feel like they don't understand climate, biodiversity is on another level. So as you sort of look at the reporting landscape and the issues that are out there that are sort of creeping up behind climate would you put sort of biodiversity 
as that next topic? Or is there another one that you really think is the, the next one that's going to get the same level of prominence? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. So um, in my conversations, it's biodiversity is everywhere, but so are social measures. Um, not only with respect to your own workforce, where part of that is human rights in the supply chain, part of that is just diversity, equity, and inclusion, but part of that is also in the discussions here, the impact on affected communities that accompanies actions. And um, for example, also climate change activity mm -hmm will or may have to really get that more complete picture. So between that, the social side of things and biodiversity, I think it's it's a par. And it also depends in terms of importance, a bit on the type of company that you're talking to. Obviously a chemicals company with, with um, agricultural products will be much more affected by biodiversity than your high tech company. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I think in some ways it's an unfair question because, you know, how do you pick and choose because it is going to be depend on the company. And I also think if we go back to CSRD and the ESRS is the fact that you cover the whole spectrum. It is because these are all important to us from a societal point of view. It's just, I think again, as people are still getting up to speed on this, there's a lot to take in. And so if I'm thinking from a strategy and otherwise, sounds like your best advice would be to take a step back and say, which of these issues are most important to my company and kind of go from there? No, absolutely. I mean, particularly if you're not yet hit by mandatory reporting that covers the whole range, um, starting with climate change is the safe bet because that has also some very significant ripple effects on, on mm -hmm. other um, items. And then, and then going down the list of environmental topics, pollution, water, which is very closely related, um, and then biodiversity. But start with climate and then think, for my type of business, what is the most important topic that people are asking me about that I'm hearing in my industry organizations that, that are being brought to me. All right. Well, definitely a lot for companies to think about. Any final words of wisdom before we wrap up today? Don't get flustered by the onslaught of requirements, statistics, and standards. And, and, and really, as a company, as a CFO, as a financial director, as a sustainability professional, just get started by reaching out and, and bringing in your company the right people together to start with that plan of implementing thorough reporting that enables you to take better decisions and have better answers also for your investors that create ultimately the value that you're looking for for your company. Well, that is excellent words of wisdom to end on. So Nadia, it's always such a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Heather, for having me. And that's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.